después del siguiente descanso, de esa misma sesión. El título de esta sesión es Building Communities, o Construyendo Comunidad, puesto que uno de los principales eh, papeles que tiene el arquitecto con su trabajo es el ser capaz de reconocer las necesidades de la gente para la que trabaja y no solo de satisfacerlas, sino de beneficiar a la sociedad con la que está trabajando, cohesionándola, eh, dotándola de lugares con los que se identifique, dotándola de lugares en los que disfrute, en los que se sienta cómoda, con los que sienta un vínculo que le lleve a querer vivir en ellos, a no abandonarlos. Si pensamos, por ejemplo, mucha de la vivienda social que se hace, resulta que se hace vivienda social que bueno, pues puede ser muy atractiva para las revistas, pero donde la gente luego no, no le gusta vivir por una serie de razones. ¿no? Y pongo este ejemplo, pero podría haber muchos otros. ¿no? Eh, y esto realmente es un, un problema bastante grave y muy extendido. Y lo que vamos a ver son una serie de intervenciones, ya digo, en, 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 varias, en varios intervalos, porque tenemos el descanso de la comida, donde vamos a ver ejemplos donde lo que se ha buscado es precisamente lo contrario, ¿no? crear... Un, eh, un entorno urbano, crear un conjunto, una arquitectura, eh, lugares con los que, con los que la, sienta, la gente se sienta cómoda, se sienta bien y se sienta identificada con ellos. Eh, os dejo con, con Melissa del Vecchio. Melissa del Vecchio es eh, socia de, de Robert Stern. Eh, es, estudió en Notre Dame, como decían antes, ha sido una de las mejores alumnas de, de la escuela en Notre Dame. Y os va a enseñar uno, un proyecto que creo que os va a resultar muy interesante en uno de sus proyectos más recientes. Good afternoon. Uh, first, I'd like to say thank you to Richard Driehaus and to the University of Notre Dame for inviting me to be on the jury for this year's Rafael Manzano Marchos Prize. It's a great honor. Um, I also bring with me warm congratulations to Donald Gray from Robert Stern and from all of my partners. Thank you. <laughs> I bring warm congratulations to Donald Gray from Robert Stern and all of my partners. Um, and thank you to Alejandro for inviting me to present at this conference and for arranging a series of topics that are such a fitting reflection of Mr. Gray's lifetime of work. I've chosen to spend my time today sharing with you our design for two new residential colleges at Yale University. And since many of you may not be familiar with the Yale campus or even university life in America, uh, it seems appropriate to set the stage with a brief architectural history highlighting the way in which Yale has built, demolished, repurposed, restored, and renovated itself since its founding in 1701. I would argue that with each historical reinvention, Yale did not follow the fashion of the times, but rather actively created an environment reflective of its aspirations and institutional mindset. Our residential colleges are no exception to this repeated pattern of intentional placemaking. Within the popular imagination, the image on this slide, stone Gothic towers and courtyards arranged in the manner of Oxford and Cambridge, is Yale. But this image is really a 20th century invention built when Yale was already 200 years old and constructed in considerable in considerable part on the ruins of two campuses that preceded it. This is actually the Yale of the 18th century, the so-called brick row, a line of austere dormitories, classrooms, and a chapel that reflected Yale's and New Haven's Puritan roots. But by the middle of the 19th century, Yale was transforming itself into a modern university. The brick row was rejected as too closely associated with utilitarian mill towns, and a new stone Yale was built with fine buildings by notable 19th century architects. The university entered the 20th century with a bold plan for transformation in order to address its integration with the adjacent Sheffield Scientific School and to cope with a rapidly growing student body. John Russell Pope's 1919 plan for the campus established the predominant use of the stone collegiate Gothic as the and the typology of perimeter buildings with interior courtyards. 
although Pope's grand unifying vision was ultimately unrealized. James Gamble Rogers' revisions and executions of his plan resulted in an entirely new campus of Gothic and Georgian quadrangles. James Gamble Rogers' first major building at Yale, the Harkness Memorial Quadrangle, completed in 1921, was deliberately conceived in emulation of Oxford and Cambridge, and this typology became Yale's development template for decades to come. And I thank Javier Senecasalaya for giving you a full education on that building type this morning. Um, in preparation for this construction, Yale President Arthur Twining Hadley at the time said, and this is a, an abbreviated quote, a monumental building, if it be really beautiful and glorious, gives a visible and permanent object around which life and loyalty can grow and to which tradition and sentiment can attach. He added that World War I had, quote, distorted our standards, compelling us to look too much for immediate efficiency. Doubly important then is it to renew our supply of tradition and inspiration by buildings like this to bring home to the students the lessons of affection and loyalty and love of the beautiful, which should go into the life of an ancient college. In 1926, a few years after the Memorial Quadrangle's completion, Edward S. Harkness extended his family's generosity once again, this time proposing a plan for a full residential college system even closer to the English prototypes. These smaller residential communities within the university would include space for dining, common rooms, libraries, a house for a master, and other social spaces. The new quadrangles at Yale were realized in less than a decade between 1932 and 1940. Eight of the original 10 colleges were designed by James Gamble Rogers, the other two by John Russell Pope and Pope's successor firm, Eggers and Higgins. From this point forward, the residential college system became the cornerstone of Yale undergraduate life. Some of the colleges extended the Oxbridge metaphor with Gothic detailing, but others looked back to Yale's Georgian era beginnings. All were inspiring compositions grounded in tradition, but wholly inventive. There were some critics of Yale's adopted Gothic persona at the time, notably William Harlan Hale, writing in an undergraduate review called The Harkness Hoot in 1930, questioned the quote unquote girder Gothic being deployed at Yale while quote, great minds elsewhere were fashioning a new age of minimalist, transparent, unsentimental architecture. But in the end, President Hadley's logic of 1917 was proven right and Rogers' convincing invention is a campus beloved by students and alumni. After World War II, the institutional mindset changed again, and under the leadership of President A. Whitney Griswold and the guidance of Aero Saarinen as master planner, the campus was peppered with singular buildings by leading modernist architects. These were intended to present the ancient university to the world as a modern research-based institution. New buildings were commissioned from some of the post-war generation's leading American architects, Louis Kahn, Gordon Bunshaft, Paul Rudolph, and Aero Saarinen. Their highly individualistic up-to-the-minute buildings were knit into the campus context punctuating the existing traditional fabric and transforming the university into what Robert Stern has called, quote, something of an outdoor museum of modernism, but one that was strictly framed by traditional architecture, unquote. The two new residential colleges added by Saarinen during this period were completed in 1962. Saarinen's take was a decisive break from his other work a considered and creative interpretation of the historic colleges he had appreciated as a Yale student. The colleges were a significant departure both visually and programmatically from their predecessors. Although the characteristic public, social, and study spaces were mostly retained, suites of multiple bedrooms around a common room were done away with in favor of single bedrooms. 
This was a dramatic change for the student community and ultimately proved unsuccessful and was rectified in recent renovations. Although there were no major changes to the college system after the admission of women in 1969, Yale did entertain a proposal for two new colleges in 1972 designed by the New York firm Mitchell, Mitchell Jerugla Architects. The project was never realized due to community opposition. And so no changes to the residential college system were implemented until 1993 when President Richard Levin initiated a complete repair and revival of campus buildings, including a much needed restoration and renovation of the 12 existing residential colleges. After completing these upgrades in 2008, the university decided to expand the Yale undergraduate community by 15%, roughly 800 new students, increasing the student body for the first time since co-education in 1969. So with this decision came many new requirements, expanding faculty, building classrooms and infrastructure, and also building two new residential colleges. A location for these two new colleges was first considered as part of the Cooper, Robertson, and Partners framework plan in the year 2000. Building on Pope's legacy of a grand vision for an interconnected university, the framework plan literally turned everyone's mental map of Yale around, orienting the campus map in the north-south direction for the first time, revealing a virtually unbroken spine of institutional ownership threaded through the town. The site for the new colleges, across from Saarinen's Ingalls Rink and bordered by the historic Grove Street Cemetery, was identified as a key development place. We're creating a continuous and identifiable Yale context would serve to better connect the campus core with the science facilities to the north. And you, you can see here our site the Ingalls Rink, largely the, the science campus up here to the north, and the campus core in the center. Following our selection as the architect, we began building models of each of the existing residential colleges, both to understand Roger's genius for massing and to add to a giant model of the Yale campus that we used to identify planning and massing strategies that would collapse the perceived distance of the North Campus from the core. Although many imagine Yale as a predominantly stone campus, in fact, stone and brick are mixed liberally, with brick representing a substantial material component, especially in the vicinity of our site. Our choice of the Gothic language also strongly relates the nearby Gothic science buildings to Rogers Gothic buildings at the campus core. The site is bounded by two major streets and a public bicycle path on a former canal and rail bed known as the Farmington Canal Greenway. These colleges are designed as fraternal twins, each with its unique features and character, but clearly related to one another, arranged across a public pedestrian passage called Prospect Walk. In this slide, you see a view of Prospect Walk from the east and here a view of the entrance to Prospect Walk from the bicycle path along the Greenway. Continuing Roger's strategy of varied massing, towers punctuate the roof line, aligning with the city's street grid in a way which brings these new buildings into, com into conversation with others in the campus core. Each of these was considered carefully in relationship to the scale and character of other important contributors to the Yale skyline. So here you can see in yellow our new towers and in black and white the other famous towers around the campus. And here you see that tallest tower from the bicycle path. <clears throat> Like the historic colleges, ours combine large courtyards, in this case, specifically designed to accommodate graduation ceremonies, and also smaller courtyards, creating a series of outdoor spaces around which the student rooms and public elements are distributed. 
The logic of Rogers massing, and this is one of his important innovations in contrast to the English precedents that Javier showed this morning, had to do with finding ways to assure that good sunlight would penetrate into the courtyards even through the dreary Connecticut winters. Taller masses on the north sides of courtyards and lower ones on the south assure good sunlight but also allow efficient planning of dormitory rooms on these urban sites. We continually tested our schemes against this benchmark. And you can see shadow studies of our scheme on the left and of the Memorial Quadrangle and Jonathan Edwards College on the main campus on the right. In locating the public programs, we studied the variation in the existing colleges, also balancing the need on our site for shared loading and service. The two dining halls and common rooms are located across from one another along Prospect Walk. This allowed a shared kitchen and underground connection at the basement level and shared loading concealed between two miniature rooftop courtyards at the north end of the site. So the loading is concealed under this piece here. Because our two colleges include freshmen, they're also at the larger end of the size spectrum at Yale. To accommodate required seating and also maintain the charming and intimate scale of the smaller historic dining halls, we planned side rooms and alcoves within the dining spaces. Here you see a plan of the North College Dining Hall with its side dining room, which is useful for events and also helps provide this additional seating. This view of the same space shows the interior character, a combination of Gothic and classical deta details characteristic of Yale. The South College instead uses a series of alcoves and bay window seats to reach its larger seat count. And this view shows the different and more classically inspired character of this room. The college libraries are located adjacent to the common rooms and dining halls. Here you see the North College Library with its oculus. And in this slide, the South College Library with its vaulted ceiling and alcove steady carols. <clears throat> Each college also has a master's house, a house provided for the faculty member who oversees the college community. This is not a private residence. The ground floor is considered part of the college's public space where masters host events ranging from weekly lectures, dinners, and study breaks to large parties on occasions such as graduation. Designed with these parties and events in mind, the houses are planned for a flow of people through interior spaces and out to terraces and courtyards, and include accommodations for catering as well as overnight guests. Private quarters for the master are on the second floor, and additional apartments are provided elsewhere for deans and a limited number of faculty fellows. This view shows the South College Master's House as seen from Prospect Street. The houses are entered both from the street and from the courtyards, so they have a public face to both. <clears throat> of course, the student housing is the fabric that knits these public elements together. Here you see a plan showing the location of the public rooms and the student suites filled in between them. Blue shows the freshman suites, which are largely the same, although clustered together, and orange indicates the upper class suites. <clears throat> The historic Yale student housing model was designed on a so-called entryway system. This entryway system, shown at the top of the slide, is comprised of suites containing bedrooms and a common room, planned on a narrow floor plate, and organized vertically off a single stair landing where a shared bathroom is located. But this arrangement does not meet current building codes. So when the historic colleges were renovated, Passages were added through adjacent suites, providing access to two fire stairs, as shown in the plan at the bottom of the slide. The university considered it critically important that we find a way to retain the essential spirit of this historic housing. But in a new building, neither the historic layout at the top nor the strategy for renovations at the bottom was permitted, and handicapped accessibility to all areas was also required. To address this, we developed what we call a modified entryway system, 
allowing for two stairs and an elevator serving a slightly larger group of rooms to be connected, thereby meeting fire and accessibility codes. This planning approach had the benefit of retaining the basic organization of the historic housing arrangement, while also allowing a floor plate almost as narrow as the precedence so that we could maintain a similar scale at the roof line. <clears throat> as we moved through the different phases of design, models in increasingly large <coughs> scales kept a team of 20 to 30 working together effectively. Each team member was assigned a courtyard or subset of building area inside or out as their responsibility. At each scale of design, we looked back to the precedents we thought that we knew so well, and Rogers continued to teach us. We created a catalog of type and variation across the campus for every element on the buildings. Here you see some roof details, but our 75-page document also catalogs chimneys, windows, light fixtures, buttresses, stone and brick coursing, and numerous other details. This investigation taught us how repetition could provide efficiency, while strategic moments of variation could achieve the kind of delightful inventiveness so characteristic of Roger's work. Early mock-ups tested constructability, especially for the highly repetitive elements and details, and also helped to confirm material selection and cost models. <clears throat> We've also been working with artisans to develop the details, like the ornamental ironwork shown here, in keeping with the quality and distinctiveness of the existing colleges. This slide shows a few mock-ups developed by a company called Kovacs Design for details of one of the main entrance gates. And the things that you see on the left, it may be hard to see on the slide, are actual. Uh, <laughs> I'm almost done. There's also ornamental elements, in total some 400 pieces of, oh, sorry, in keeping with Roger's work, there, these new colleges have both carved stone and cast stone ornamentation. Here you see the molds developed from our computer models for Gothic window tracery and also the prefab prefabricated chimney produced by a company called BPDL in Quebec. There are also ornamental elements, in total over 400 pieces of stone and cast stone that are planned for the buildings. These images show the Gothic ornamentation in progress at the workshop of traditional cut stone in Toronto. And in keeping with the Yale tradition, there's also a program for a witty iconographic ornament specific to Yale history, which is being developed by Patrick Pinnell, an architect and author of a popular Yale campus guide. This view shows you construction today um, in expectation of a 2017 opening. So as we set out to bring 21st century standards of collegiate living and environmental responsibility to residential life at Yale, we allowed Rogers to show us the way. Our designs address modern problems and embrace new technologies while at the same time engaging existing building patterns and traditions to meaningfully inform our response to the campus's evolving community while reinforcing the essential spirit of residential life at Yale. Thank you, and a short video will play with. Bye.